some great news on the Stony Brook front. Both basketball teams are rolling. And where shall we begin, Ken? With, with the uh, with Gigi Gonzalez making the Sports Center top 10 or men 4 and 5? I'm a four, but yeah, like, definitely start with the women. I think you know, only one game this week, and as you said, you know they really went all out in the game against Penn, getting a big W, seventy-five to sixty-nine. And there were four key players that really stepped up for the Sea Wolves that game. Gigi Gonzalez, of course, a big factor, fourteen points, did most of her damage in that second half of nine points in the final two quarters of play. And as you said, a beautiful. Score for to the basket, getting on Sports Center, Matt. The fall away and the foul, and what's even funnier is that the last time Stony Brook made the Sports Center top ten twice, Kevin Crowley was involved in that one too, because of course this involved one current Stony Brook player and one Stony Brook alum, because. Gigi made number seven, and Kevin Crowley with a very impressive one-timer in for the Philadelphia Wings in the National Lacrosse League. He made number three, and he had an over-the-shoulder goal in 2010. Tom Compatello with a one-handed wraparound. That was an NCAA tournament game back in 2010. But even before the College World Series run, Stony Brook was getting on the Sports Center top ten. So... And the nice thing about it is that the Sports Center announcers mentioned that Crowley was a Stony Brook alum. So they got in there. I'm very, very impressed. Usually Not a bad these week. guys sails right over their heads. Not a bad week to be a Z-Wolf for sure, Matt. Okay, so the women are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Okay, that is flat out win you take a look at their schedule and they've had one loss so far this year and admittedly you're not talking about there are no Kansases in this there are no Yukon there are no Yukons there are no you know top five teams they have not faced a ranked opponent they have beaten teams from power conferences, as we said, St. John's and Rutgers. Okay. They're all very nice wins. They had a little bit, I don't know if you call it a setback. They, they got a day off because on Tuesday, Marist had to back out of their matchup because of COVID protocols. So that got canceled. But that left them fresh and ready to go against Penn. Second Ivy League team they've beaten this year. They beat Columbia as well. And you got to be happy with your with what, what you're looking at as they take on Hofstra on... Actually, they have a whole week off to the finals. So it's not this coming Tuesday, Hofstra. It's next Tuesday. So they get a nice little break there. Yeah. Oh, agreed. And as you said, they're definitely eager, I think, to get back on the court after suffering that first loss. And it was important, I think, for them to go through that loss just in the sense of, you know, you start the season 8-0. and It's tough to really build on what you need to improve on when you're winning all the time. <laughs> so it definitely showed them there, you know, what they needed to work on. And I think as a whole, you know, there's a lot of positives to take out of that win against Penn. It was still a tight contest, though, especially in that first half. It was very back and forth, seven lead changes overall in the game. I think pretty much all of them happened in the first half. But, you know, it was really that uh, towards the end of the first half to the beginning of the third quarter where Stony Brook really started to carry that momentum to a victory. You know, they had a 12-0 run uh, towards the end of the second quarter. And essentially, they were able to lead 43-36 by the end of that little run. And they never looked back. And a big reason for that was just their ability to stay hot in terms of shooting, 47% in the second quarter, 46% in the third overall, as well as get to the free throw line, especially in that fourth quarter. 
And I think that this was a game that really tested them because, as you said, they were fresh off a loss mm-hmm. and had to sit on it a few extra days because of the cancellation from right. Marist. And going back to that Fordham loss, though, because that came as a little bit of a, of a surprise because of all the teams they faced, is Fordham necessarily the best one? You know, I think so, especially just looking at RPI rankings. You know, Fordham's pretty high up there. You know, amongst yeah. 60 best teams, Stony Brook's around, you know, 80s, 90s. You know, it's, it wasn't the worst. Plus, of course, you know, Asia Dingle playing a slight factor in that. Former Seawolf past couple seasons playing against her former team. She had 12 points, second most behind. Anna DeWolf was, you know, just virtually <laughs> untouchable. But, uh, you know, at the same time, it, it showed, you know, where this team needed to and what this team needed to work on. And, you know, I, I thought we really saw it in terms of, you know, them limiting the turnovers from compared to Fordham's game to this one, and especially off uh, second chance opportunities. I thought that was a difference maker for this team. The only thing that gives you a little bit of pause. Okay. Let me just look at the Stony Brook numbers here. Well, they, didn't have to rely very heavily on three-point shooting. And thank God, because as you were saying, their overall field goal percentage was respectable overall uh, going against Penn, against, in the Penn game. One for seven in the first quarter, two for six, one for three and oh for two. If you get into a bomb fest with somebody, that's not going to carry you. Right. Fortunately... The Seawolves play very well down low and can compensate. But if yeah, they was- go up against a team that has a bunch of Steph Curry's on, they got problems. <laughs> yeah, and you know, we kind of saw that in that four game. You know, we were talking about Anna DeWolf. She won four seven from three. Asia Dingo, of course, who we know, you know, the second lean score behind Anna, who did a lot of her damage inside. And even though she, if she was six for 15, she still was able to get 12 points on him. So, yeah, you know, as you said, you know, as you said, definitely that plane towards top of the perimeter, you know, towards top of the arc is definitely been a bit more challenging for this team. It's been one of the reasons, too, why it was such a close game in the first half. Although with, uh, excuse me, with Penn, you know, they shot 36 percent and 42 percent as well overall in that first half. However, again, with Stony Brook, it was that battle of the bigs that was a big contributor towards the win and you know Naramore Vargas for example Vargas Reyes 14 rebounds you know the ability for her just crashing to the boards getting kickstarting the offensive swing for Stony Brook as well as contributing to the 15 second chance opportunities the Seals got on that game you know that was a big momentum uh, shifter towards Stony Brook's favor in that game and we can't discount the return of India Pagan to the lineup. Yeah. 20 points, setting the pace for the Seawolves. Eight rebounds. So right behind uh, Nairamar. So they did pretty well up until then. Of course, the Fordham loss kind of was a little bit of a reminder about how shorthanded they might have been. But, but Pagan means that they're back at full strength. And... Cannot yeah. come a moment too soon. Yeah, I was going to say, there's a little about Boucher in that win. So not full strength, but as you said, you know, pretty close. And as you're talking about, you know, just the importance of the bigs on this team. So we know how good the guards are with uh, Annie Warren, who also missed uh, the Penn game. Uh, Earl Scott and Gigi Gonzalez, you know, those three have really been, I think, the scoring leaders for this team so far this season. So for Pagan to finally get her breakout game this season as well as uh, Vargas Reyes on the boards I think is big towards displaying this team's strength as a whole and further aiding to it that you know they're not giving up opportunities for the other team to capitalize on you know Stony Brook team besides being really good in the paint this game 42 points of their 75 coming from inside they scored 20 off turnovers 15 second chance points and their death came through with 15 points as well I think they caught a little bit of a break, though, because as 
troubled as they were from three points, so uh, Penn were they were pretty bad too. Seven yeah. for thirty, and they tried. They tried to bomb their way back into the game, and maybe the reason why it stayed as close as it did because they were able to hit a couple. But it does kind of have put something in the back of your head for upcoming matchups because what comes up for them is, as we said, they get a week off for finals, but they have two road games coming up. One of them is at Hofstra, Tuesday, December 21st, Christmas week, and then they sit for nine days and the America East kicks in away at NJIT in Newark. And then they get Hartford. But the America East is looming, and you don't want to have any missteps. You want to be able to assert yourself over this uh, over this conference. And when I look at the scores of the non-conference games that the America East teams have been playing, yes, they have played some strong schools, as is general policy in the America East. But... I don't necessarily see too many threats to the Seawolves, uh, you know, taking the top spot. Yeah, you know, comparing Stony Brook to the rest of the conference, number one, it's important for them, I think, to show that, you know, them being the heavy favorites in the preseason poll is matching up with their current play so far. You know, offensively, especially, they lead in a lot of offensive categories. You know, they've, every team has played at least eight games. Stony Brook leads the conference, averaging 71 points per contest. Binghamton is second best with 64. Margin of victory is 10.9 for the Seawolves, so nearly 11 points uh, better than their opponents. They're the only team above uh, 10 points in terms of margin of victory. And defensively as well, you know, they're giving up about 60 points per game, but that still puts them uh, tie fourth. And Vermont and New Hampshire are second and third best with 57 and 58. Really, you know, the best defensive showing so far has come from U Albany, you know, only surrendering 399 points so far, which is less than 50 per game for them, as well as uh, scoring about 57 points offensively. But, you know, for Stony Brook, they have, they've shown so far that they have the best offense for sure in this conference. And again, with the play styles that this team runs, you know, under Coach Lankford, there's so many weapons and so tough to guard them at on any given day. You know, every every game we review, it's not just one woman leading the scoring. You know, one day it could be Annie Warren. Another, it's Erlet Scott. Another, it's India Pagan. You know, they just run that triangle offense so well. Yes, and that way you can't key on any one player. And the depth looks good very good too especially when they do have everybody in the lineup it looks right now I don't see too many obstacles like you said Albany with great defense could give them trouble provide Albany hits all shots right but that's really what it's going to take to beat them you're going to have to out defend them and you're going to have to shoot better but the opportunity is there to shoot better because they do have some things they need to work on. Okay, so turning now to the men, because the men got off to a slower start, largely because they're playing power conference schools, let's be honest. You know, they were playing, they started off with George Mason and Kansas. So, you know, it was not going to be a cakewalk for them no matter what you did. Kansas ranked third, I believe, right now. But dropping one to Fairfield, the one to Wagner was a wake-up call because they came out like gangbusters against Hofstra. And compared to what I've seen them do against Hofstra in recent years, I was blown away with what I saw on Wednesday. Agreed. You know, it's a Hofstra team especially, which looks really good over the past couple of seasons. The CAA champs over the past few seasons, you know, there's a lot of talent 
on that men's Hofstra side. So it was the women's, but uh, just focusing on the men's, you know, a lot of talent there. And, you know, it looked like early on, especially that first half, it was mostly all Hofstra was swimming. And coming out of the locker room, they scored seven of the first nine points. And, you know, they have that eight-point lead, and it sure seemed like the Pride were ready to, you know, just go on that run and pull out the victory. But it was the Seawolves that managed to just completely flip the script around. 27-6 to run. And a big part of that was the team's reliance and success hitting three-pointers. Which is not what you necessarily expect from a Seawolves team. But they had... Probably one of their better days from three point range since Geno Ford's been coach. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's been the I biggest mean, adjustment for sure for this team. You know, when they have their when they go to the three point game and they're hidden, you know, they are a tough team to beat. Helped as well with when the Pride really stuck to the two three zone during the run. You know, I thought that was their biggest detriment. Is they didn't really get out of that two three zone until later in the run. And even when they did, they were still, you know, mismatched or a guy was a step or two behind leading to some easy Seawolf buckets. Well, here's the thing. If you're running a 2-3 zone and your opponent is shooting in the second half, 9 for 15 from 3, wake up. Go attack the perimeter because (laughs) they're just going to do it all day long if you let them. And that's pretty much what Hofstra did. 9 for 15 from 3 in the second half. That's 60%. Seawolves don't do that. I mean, it could be a turnaround. It could be something that we're going to be looking for the rest of the year. That improved three-point performance. Because the Seawolves teams, even under Steve Peichel, have never been known for it. But more importantly, that if you have that weapon... Just like the women need to develop it more, you can really surprise people with it. Yeah, you know, I think that development is important for both teams. And I think, you know, the women do a good job of it so far. And it's, it's something, again, I think every, both teams still need to improve on, you know, especially on the men's side, where, you know, it, re- it wasn't really clicking against Wagner. But as you said, you know, that was a difference maker in this game against the Pride because they made, again, they attempted. Eight threes made seven of them that second starting off the second half. And essentially they got out to a 64 50 lead, never really looked back. So, you know, it's that really turned the tide for a game that was closely going in favor of Austria. And, you know, a big reason for that too is, you know, seeing these three point shooters step up for Stony Brook. Jaleel Jenkins this time, three for seven overall on the contest. Tyler Stevenson Moore. Leading the team going four for seven from three point arc. Well, even that, you have improved performance from the line as well. But just like the women, you have a different hero every night. Jaleel Jenkins was definitely the hero in the Hashi game. 24 points overall, seven for 17 from the field. And that means that he was four for 10 otherwise. And too for that game, Frankie Policelli from three coming off the bench, responsible for half of the team's overall bench points that game, 12 of the 24. He was perfect from three point range, going four for four, including uh, hitting some of those key shots, where uh, including that shot where it gave the team that 14 point advantage with under eight minutes to go. So, you know, he was a big factor as well, you know, in extending that lead and really confirming that the three-point game was there for Stony Brook. But the bigs, two guys in double figures with rebounds, Mm -hmm. Green and Stevenson Moore, and that's also a big plus. Yeah. Get the ball, kick it out, take a shot, and that's what worked for them. Now, is that necessarily going to work for them every night? As we said, you know, Wagner, everything went wrong. But now you go fast forward to last night. They take on Bryant, and once again, different hero. Anthony Roberts is the hero on 6-14 shooting, 5-5 five five from the line, 8 rebounds, 20 points, and Green right behind him with 19, and Jenkins with 13. 
Hobway with 12, and Rodriguez with 11. So you get five guys in double figures. And the three-point shooting, not quite as good, but didn't have to be. Yeah, just because of the team, of how well they performed in that first half. You know, it was honestly, I think their biggest factor towards the win. It was an 86-78 win, but it got real close. And down to the final minute, it was only a one-point game. And before the Seawolves were able to get to the line. And to me, it felt like the Seawolves carried that momentum from the second half of the Hofstra game into at least the first half of the contest against the Bulldogs and then kind of went on cruise control and almost coughed up the lead. But, you know, with Stony Brook, they, they still, I thought, shot well. Well, they shot okay from the field overall in that second half, 40%. But they are shooting 56% from in that first half. And a big reason exactly. was just their ability to keep getting guys open. And they took 15 threes, made five, which wasn't too bad. But they were able to do some damage in the paint as well. 36 points overall in the game. Winning in different ways. That's usually considered the mark of a good team. That you don't have to use the same formula or the same guys even. Or rely on the same guys night in, night out. And that gives you a much more balanced attack naturally. Yeah. But for that game too, the defense was a factor. Just in the sense of Stony Brook was able to outscore their opponents in points off turnovers, 20 to 17. Uh, really, the difference maker was the fast break points, 14 to 4 on the fast break. Brown was just a step behind Huge. in transition, especially in that first half. And again, it was the reason why Seawolves shot 56, 33, 75 in the first 20 minutes of play. So the men don't necessarily have the break the women have. The women have finals week, then they have a game, they have another nine-day layover. Not so the men, because they will be... Now, the good thing is that the next two games will be at home as part of this long homestand they've had, which would be Tuesday, December 14th, Central Connecticut, and then they've got St. Peter's on Saturday the 18th. But then... The second-ranked opponent they face this year, number 14, Florida, looms large on Wednesday, December 22nd. And again, no break, because the following Wednesday, they're back in action against Farmingdale, one last non-conference game before uh, taking on Hartford on the road that Sunday. So, no let-up. They don't get... And now, if you're, if you're an engineering major or something like that, and you got finals coming up... You, you got to find a way to make that work, and they do. But it's kind of a stark contrast to the women's schedule that it's nonstop. Right, and I think part of it as well is just with, you know, women's team now, I think they're really in a spot where, you know, they're, for the most part, I think, comfortable in terms of, you know, what the identity of this team is going to be. And, you know, they performed so well so far just front-loading that schedule that I thought it, it, it's a really big factor for them. I don't want to say necessarily needing, you know, those same amount of games or playing during that same time frame because there's a multitude of factors that go into that, such as maybe a lack of opponents, you know, on the other end. But, you know, for the team, they thought they played so well in the front-load of that schedule that, you know, that buffer I don't think is going to take away too much of the team. And it's with players like Annie Warren and Mackenzie Boucher missing time already, you know, I think it's a good time for them to get a rest, get back to 100%, and get healthy in time for the America East, especially when they open up against competition on teams like NGIT and Hartford, which, quite frankly, are games that they should win and win by a lot. You know, on that men's side, the break, not having that break kind of hurts them, especially with them already without Elijah Olani due to lower body injury for the past couple weeks. 